Oh, hey, there we are. Hey, Gabor, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm good. How are you? All right. So this is uh, what I like to call Jams Drupalcast. I have the pleasure and the privilege to see a bunch of people do presentations throughout the year, spend a lot of time with people in the Drupal community, and I thought at some point that there's a lot of stuff going on. There are a lot of good sessions going on that deserve some more attention, that deserve, um, you know, that people in our community would find useful, would find interesting, would find exciting, and some percentage of those, maybe even if they're films, maybe even if they're um, on some camp website somewhere, they're not easy to find, and if you don't know to go to a particular site, you might not know that that stuff exists. And I just thought that it would be nice to get some more sessions online and some more people talking about Drupal online and get some resources that we could all find. So this is kind of an extension of the Acquia podcast where I talk anyway with people about Drupal and about open source technology, community, and business. And here we are. Let's just talk a little bit about your background, Gabor, in case somebody hasn't heard of you in the Drupal world or in case somebody's checking this out because they need a spectacular new CMS that has amazing multilingual capabilities, right? So, yeah. Gabor Hoichi, you are still the lead of Drupal 6, that major point release? Indeed, yes. What else do you do in your day? So, I work for Acquia in the office of the CTO and I work a lot on Drupal 8 itself. So these days, that means working on anything that would uh, move Drupal 8 forward towards release, fixing bugs, uh, helping the configuration management system with the entity system. There's a lot of fun stuff that I'm learning in there. Uh, I also document a lot of what I found, uh, for, uh, find for the community. Uh, before that, I worked on the Spark initiative in the office of the CTO, which was great for authoring experience improvements in Drupal 8, in-place editing, uh, mobile tools, etc. And I'm also, in my free time, I'm working on the multilingual initiative, leading um, uh, these people working on improving multilingual tools in Drupal 8, and that's what this session is going to be about. Right, in all of your free time. Right? Yeah, all, <laughs> all of that free time, yes. So let's just talk, before we get to your presentation, um, remind me what your first Drupal memory is. Ooh, so, um, so I used to be involved with the Hungarian web development community site. So I actually set it up with a friend that's called weblabor.au. And uh, that was running an old um, PHP Nuke CMS. And uh, we wanted to make it look better, so we wrote a whole layer on top of PHP Nuke to pre-process the HTML and reformat it and stuff. And then we figured out that's pretty much um, just fighting against, um, against the system. So we started looking for other solutions, and Drupal came to my scene in 2003. And I really liked the system of nodes and the, and the flexibility that it offered. I also liked the separate admin interface, which was removed two months later and then added back on in, in Drupal 7. That's kind of fun. Um, so yeah, so I found that uh, really great. And I introduced that to the team on the site. And they liked that as well. So we migrated the site. And it's a full Hungarian site. So we needed to make Drupal speak Hungarian 100%. Uh, and that. And there were issues making that happen. So I was filing issues and solving problems in Drupal to be able to work in different languages. And that was t almost 11 years now. And I'm still working on language problems. So I either suck at solving them, or there are a lot of them. <laughs> so what version of Drupal was that that you taught to speak Hungarian that first time that, around? That was 4.3, I think. Wow. 2003, yeah. So you can take this in the multilingual context, or you can take it in a bigger context. But compare Drupal now to Drupal 4.3 when you got started. Oh, wow. Um, I think it, it's worlds apart. Um, I've been to the first uh, DrupalCon in, uh, in Antwerp. That was in a hotel basement. And there was like, we needed to rent another room so that everybody fits in. And we were like 20 or 30 people. 
the Hoong Big community, and um, and now there's there's routinely Drupal camps around the world that attract hundreds of people uh, easily from their respective regions. So I really liked how the community exploded and how I how I see uh, friends everywhere and how we can work together. And I think that. That community explosion helped skyrocket the work itself. So now I work uh, with a lot of people on just multilingual, as many people as as have been working on Drupal itself back in that day. So I think I think it's it enables just so much that it's it's hard to even understand. A lot of the people who were at that very first Drupal event are actually still working in Drupal. I wonder if that's, I don't know what it means, but it's somehow a testament to the, the strength of the community that, that the technology platform of Drupal has built around itself. Um, off the top, no, see, if I start listing names off the top of my head, then I'm going to forget someone. Yeah. And, and so, but a lot of those 30 people um, are still in the project, and, uh, and uh, it's great. So let's see. What is your favorite Drupal module? Hmm, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, I think so. I think I'm gonna be boring and pick from multilingual. Um, my favorite is uh, localization updates, which uh, which we built into Drupal eight, but it used to be a separate module. And, uh, and it really solves a lot of the pains with getting your site set up in multiple languages. Because if you set up a language, you need to download translations for every module for a core itself. And the site can routinely have 100 modules. So you need to download 100 translations and import them manually. And if you have three languages, it becomes 300 files. And then when you update a module, you need to download, again, the updated translation. So it's a lot of pain. And that's uh, automated with the module. I think that's um, that's really uh, a key to 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 making things work automatically that can be automated. All right, that sounds like a very sensible choice. In yeah. Fact. What's the what's the coolest thing that you've built or done with Drupal? Hmm. I think the coolest thing that I've done is co-organizing DrupalCon Sega 2008 with uh, Christoph Van Tom. Uh, that's an event that that is remembered and is still still often mentioned in the community. I think it was an amazing event at an amazing time. Um, and uh, this year, I'm I'm volunteering actually in my extra extra free time, right? So I'm volu <laughs> I'm volunteering with uh, Drupal Dev Days that's um, going to happen in Saget in March. And uh, one of the plans is to bring back that 2008 feeling. All right. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun there. So Drupal community back to the roots. Yes. Sounds, sounds really, really good. Absolutely. This first piece here is going to be a little teaser podcast for your presentation. So mm -hmm. let's underscore at this point that you are also the multilingual initiative lead for Drupal 8. Yeah. And the session that I saw you present at Drupal Camp Vienna in December 2013 uh, is uh, the one that you're going to do here on Jam's Drupal Camp. And it's about everything that's been done and all of the improvements that have gone into Drupal um, <clears throat> 8 for multilingual, but also, you know, you could probably, uh, you, the audience, can probably understand a lot of historical context and, and how hard the problem space is and how far we've come and, you know, how much Gabor and the people working on the initiative have done for us. So, Gabor, thank you in advance because um, it's amazingly exciting and really, really wonderful. The podcast is going to cut off right around here, and so then we're going to sw swap over into Gabor's live Drupal Camp session. So, Gabor, why don't you... Uh, Tell us where, where this is coming from, what this is all about, and launch into your session. If anybody wants to put up questions on the Q&A tab, uh, we can get to those a little bit later on. And um, Gabor Hoichi, take it away. Sure. Um, so um, 
let me switch over to my presentation and then start that up. If only the screen share button would respond to what I want to do. You can also do your session in interpretive dance if you need to. Yeah, that may that may be an interesting idea to do. Yeah. Um, so interestingly, the screen share button is not working on this at all. So maybe if I close down the toolbox, then then it will agree to share my screen. We we tested this and it worked. Yeah, we did. <laughs> so have you seen this situation before that you click screen share and nothing basically happens ever? I haven't. Let me oh here, let's try this. Okay. I'm gonna turn off the QA and see if that makes any difference. Try now. No. Hmm. Exciting. So you want me to rejoin? This is li live on the web, people. <laughs> All right, why don't you, yeah, why don't you try and rejoin, um, and uh, we'll see if it makes any difference. Okay, see you. This lets us do the classic IT um, line of why don't you try turning it off and turning it back on again. I'm hoping that he's just going to be able to come back in. Let me check and see if his invest out. Oh, there we go. Hey. hey, Gabor, I was saying very bad things about you while you were off. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, yeah. At the same time, I got the option to share now. Woohee! Yay, you can see yourself now. So, <laughs> so this session is, is titled A Whole New World for Multilingual Sites in Drupal 8. And, uh, and I really mean it because there's, there's, just, there's just changes everywhere in the system and uh, all for the better. Uh, and although I'm presenting this here, I'm not really the one who did the work. Um, I'm the one whose name is misspelled um, all the time, uh, among other Drupalists. So we are coming from a situation where not only our Drupal software, but also in some cases our events are not really multilingual by default. And I'm experiencing this firsthand at events when I get badges or when I appear on websites and the fonts are not right, or when I appear in a printed schedule for something. And, and really, this, uh, this is something that we wanted to address in the software itself as well, that multilingual should not be an afterthought for, for um, supporting these features, but it should really be an integral part of the system. If we make it an integral part, then it will just work for everybody, and there's no extra attention required to make this happen. So there's a lot of other things in Drupal 8 that are happening, and this is not uh, the only thing, obviously. There's a lot of cross-pollination between the different um, initiatives and changes that are happening. So there's uh, web service-related changes. There's the editing experience. There's views. There's configuration management. There's mobile. So mobile is, uh, multilingual is just one of these um, several initiatives. But there's a lot of benefits that we are getting from configuration management or views, for example, that, um, that boost what you can do for multilingual sites. So there's a lot of things that, um, that cross uh, different areas. And these are the people who actually made this happen. So this is a name cloud, so to say, of all the people that have been involved with uh, Drupal 8 multilingual. And the bigger the names, the, more the, uh, the bigger the involvement. And if you count these names, if you count the number of these names, then it comes down to almost a thousand people who contributed to multilingual only in Drupal 8. And we are not counting these as uh, commit mentions in Drupal uh, commits, as usually others count. We count these as involvement on the issue queue. So if there's testing or, or bug reports or anything that may not be mentioned in the commits, we include them here as well. So that's a lot of people to work with. And uh, we also have a lot of fun with these people. So if you, if you go to any event basically around Drupal, you'll probably find some of us there working on Drupal 8 Multilingual. This is a sprint from Portland DrupalCon. This is a sprint from Batcamp. 
this is a sprint at Prague DrupalCon where we've been working on some stuff. This is from Barcelona. So we really get together as much as we can and we have a lot of fun solving these problems. We uh, There's a lot of interesting people in this initiative sharing these problems and, um, and, so, and uh, solving it uh, for all of us. We also have this, not, uh, so I looked at this number and uh, we are not um, exactly there, but we are almost at uh, 1,000. We solved Drupal 8 multilingual issues, which is also uh, pretty amazing. And the reason for that is we looked at Drupal 7 multilingual as a system and we wanted to resolve the systematic problems one by one and have general solutions for them. And we also uh, broke down to a lot of these solutions to smaller pieces so that we can involve more people and so that we can make progress with our big bike shed discussions and, um, and uh, get to um, successful ends. So the problem, as we've seen with Drupal 7 multilingual sites, is there's way too many components. There's a lot of interdependencies, and it's hard to understand how to set up those components. So the basic component for Drupal 7 multilingual sites is locale module, which gives you language support and a foreign language website user interface, but it's not really enough for having a multilingual site. Even if you uh, want to set up the locale module, there's a lot of manual work. So localization update module helps you there to automate the download process for translations. So that's basically a requirement for any multilingual site. And then if you want to manage multilingual content, you need to set up the content translation module, which is included in core, but that's only useful for nodes, and it's not useful for any other type of content. Uh, if you want to have other types of content supported, like menus, taxonomy terms, uh, etc., you need to set up the I18N module, and that will let you translate a lot of things. And it also has a lot of mapping modules, like I18N views and web form localization, to map to other modules. And at this point, you have like 20 modules in your site to support your multilingual use cases, but you are not really there yet because you also want to translate your site name and your slogan and E emails that are sent out to users, and those are stored in a totally different system, and the variable module supports that with several sub-modules and glue modules with I18N as well, and then you set up an e-commerce site, uh, part of your site, which then requires an entity translation module, and now you have two different ways to translate content on your site, and you need to set them up separately. So Drupal 7 has multilingual solutions for everything, uh, and those work. The problem that we found is that there's a lot of components that you need to understand and set up, and those components um, overlap too much and not always applicable to modules and extensions in the contrib contributed module space um, to further build out your site. So we wanted to have systems for... Um, for um, separate multilingual needs built out in a way that are future compatible. So we set up four pillars that we wanted to work on. The base pillar is for handling languages, which provides base services for all modules dealing with data, not just multilingual, but um, everywhere where you need to maintain the language of something. We have an interface translation pillar, which supports the translation of the software itself and includes automation. We have a content translation pillar, which supports nodes and also all kinds of other content that can take fields and is fields-based. And we have a configuration translation solution that supports all kinds of configuration. So this pans over variables and uh, all of the stuff that IETN and module used to do in Drupal 7. And we wanted to design all of these in ways that are future compatible, so if new modules come in in Drupal 8 can trip, then those will be supported by these systems. Let's see what we achieved. Uh, for the language uh, pillar, that's pretty interesting because this did not used to be its own system, but there's a lot of things that you need to do even for basic language support if you think about it. First of all, we wanted to make language selection step one in the installer and pre-select your language based on your browser preference. So in this case, it was Hungarian. So you can pick any of the 100 languages supported by Drupal and then have it installed in that language. Even if you pick a right-to-left language like Arabic, 
then when you hit save and continue, then it will immediately download that translation. Your installer will switch to right to left. Then you can do the whole installation process in that language, in that layout, as needed by that language. So we really made it clear from the get-go that Drupal 8 is a multilingual system, that you can pick the language and there's everything translated after the first screen. If there's something not translated here, that's due to the translation missing, but everything is possible to translate here. And then we wanted to extend language assignment. Why is that important? We want Drupal to know the language of everything in the system. If Drupal knows the language of everything in the system, then, then we can work from that language. We can translate to other languages. We can do lists uh, based on filters for that, et cetera. And Drupal 7 had a really limited amount of language assignment capabilities in core. Uh, nodes, users, and path aliases can have language. And then contributed modules are needed to have language assignment for others. And or Drupal needs to assume that they are in the site's default language. So uh, what we um, have here is we've extended this to basically anything. So now in Drupal 8, you can assign language to taxonomy terms. You can assign language to views. We assign language to your site information, even if there is no language selector on there. And there's uh, basically infinite possibilities here. Why would it make sense to assign language for views, for example? You can have part of your site in German and have a page with listings that are only applicable to your German audience. There's probably no point in making that view in all the languages of your site or making that in a different language other than German. So you can focus your efforts where it makes sense. And then later on, if you need to translate that to other languages, Drupal will know that it was in German and will be uh, able to translate that from German to other languages. So this is very powerful for, um, for uh, making it easy to build sites, for creating content and configuration in the language and in the way that you want, and then even supporting translation out of that mixed state. And then we have very flexible language defaults for content. So all those selectors are uh, available everywhere. You can configure them. You can enable selector visibility on a content type basis. So for example, forum topics can be English only. And um, you can um, hide the language selector on them. We're not sure whether articles can default to English, but show the language selector on them. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So you can set up specific default languages, and you can either show or hide language selectors based on uh, what you want to have on your site. Otherwise, everything in content is created in the site's default uh, originally, unless configured uh, otherwise. So it's very easy to set up where you want to have user interfaces to fiddle with language, and then what the default for those are. And where you don't have to have user interfaces, you can set different defaults as you need them. There's also, once you have language information, there's a lot of uh, flexibility in how you do lists and pages. We have language visibility settings on blocks now. So you can show and hide blocks by language. And you can use the language information on all the things that are in Drupal to build views out of them. So you can build pages that are German only, French only, or have mixed language content, or render, render um, content in the language found by the view, et cetera. There's a lot of um, flexible options now in views uh, that we've added or are currently adding into Drupal 8 core that let you have flexible pages uh, for multilingual scenarios. And the best news is that Views is now in core. And it's not just in core, but it's also, um, it's all, it also means that a lot of the pages in Drupal core are now converted to Views. So all of those listings you can very easily customize for language support, even administration pages like the content and the user administration page. You can have language filters on them, add or remove language columns, et cetera. It's very easy to customize for multilingual sites. Then we have more flexible language selection options. For the URL language detection, we built in a much easier to use configuration screen that has everything in one place, much better than Drupal 7. We have um, account preferences for the site. We have browser configuration where we understand that the external language codes may not be the same as the internal ones. So you can add mappings for external language codes to internal language codes. That was not possible in 7. 
You can have several uh, separate preferences for admin pages, and you can have a custom fallback language for the site. So let's see why are these useful. Separate preferences for admin pages, there's a, uh, that's requested a lot. And there's a module for that called admin language in Drupal 7, where you can use the administration pages in the language that you understand, and you can edit Japanese and French and German nodes, even if you don't understand Japanese, French, and German, uh, because the interface you understand, and you can fix image problems or publication issues or do administrative things on them without understanding the language of them. You can have this set up separately. And the selected language is also very useful because now you don't need to change the site default language anymore to change the language fallback for the site. And this is a very commonly requested feature for Drupal 7 that's not possible to introduce there in core, but it's um, also in a contributed module for Drupal 7. So now this is a lot more flexible in how language is selected and a lot more useful as well. We also built in name transliteration which is uh, used for uh, machine names. Currently, if you enter something, it transliterates into an English machine name, obviously. If it's in English, that's easy. But if it's in Hungarian, as in this case, then it will use the right English characters for the transliteration. If it's in Russian, it will use the right English characters. If it's in Czech, it will use the right English characters, etc. So basically, we have built-in support for transliterating uh, different language values to English. We only support this on machine names so far. There's contributed uh, solutions for this in 7 for path aliases. We don't have that in 8. But that's uh, possible with uh, path auto module, hopefully, in 8 as well. And finally, English can be deleted from the system. That's also good news for anybody running a single language website. It, there's no need for keeping English around if you don't want to. English is not a not that special language anymore in 8. You can delete it if you want to and uh, just remove it from the system. So in summary, the language pillar uh, allows you to delete English, uh, has a flexible language selection setup, has block visibility per language. Views is in core, and a lot of pages are views. So you can build views out of all the language information. We have flexible configuration for language defaults. A lot of things know their language now. And the language selection is first in the installer, making it clear that Drupal 8 is multilingual. And this is only one of the pillars of the four pillars that we've introduced in 8 to make Drupal 8 better for multilingual sites. So let's dive into the second pillar and see what else is in here. Um, interface translation. So interface translation is for translating Drupal, the software. And the biggest problem that we found there is the lack of automated translation downloads. Because if you have 100 modules and three languages, you need to download 300 files, and then you need to keep them up to date and import them all the time. There's a lot of hassle um, in there. So we've introduced the interface translation module that provides um, nice, useful um, solutions to download all those translations automatically, and also much better interfaces for the translation itself. We centralize the translation file tracking file locations to one single place. So whatever we download from the central translation server, localized.drupal.org, we put into one directory. This is very useful for deployment. So if you want to automate these downloads on your staging server and check all the updates, then you can push this to your live server and then um, have only the Q8, only the quality assured translations pushed to the live site is very useful for, um, for um, deployment processes. So you don't need to enable automated downloads, obviously, on the live site. We also track customizations. So what we found is that translations are not always uh, easy to agree on. And sometimes people want to have different translations on their site. And they want to still keep using the automated translation updates. So what we do is we keep track of all the customizations that you make to translations on your own site. And we protect them from the automated updates to be overwritten. So the automated updates will not overwrite those translations. That's very useful for, uh, for also exporting these customizations and reusing them on other customer sites where you want to have the same set of customizations, which is also possible now. 
We have a whole new translation interface built in now, which is one single table with source, string, and translation. And we mark changes as we go. We integrated singular and plural translations into this screen. Uh, you probably don't even know the previous version of this translation screen because it was so hard to use. There were contributed modules to make it easier. Now we have a very useful interface built into Drupal 8 that's much better out of the box. So you can enter translations here, and then you can filter for translated strings and only customized translations, and you'll see that these are the things that you just customized manually on this site for your own needs. So it's much easier to um, update and touch up on translations here. It's also possible now to translate, quote unquote, translate to English. It's very easy to set up. You just edit English. There's a checkbox to enable interface translation to English. You save that, and then you will be able to switch out strings for English. So for example, you want to translate login to sign in and log out to sign out. You can do that. So you can translate uh, login to sign in, save that translation. And then if you swap out to um, log that state, you'll see that login is now appearing as sign in. So there's no extra modules required to do this anymore. There's contributed modules for this in 7 that you can install. But in 8, you can just configure Drupal to do this. Uh, it is not enabled by default due to performance reasons. Uh, by default, English is uh, more is uh, better performing than translations. But you can enable this anytime. So this is the second pillar. And there's a lot of improvements here. We kept the interface translation features from 7. And we made it possible to translate to English. We improved the translation interface itself, which is now much easier to use. We track custom translations. Uh, so you can, you can diverge from the community translations. And we protect those translations so they are not overwritten when updates happen. We centralized the file directory for uh, downloading those updates. So this can be um, Q&A and deployed from staging to live. We have this automated download system that um, frees you from a lot of manual work. And this is now a separate module. So if you want to only track language information on things, like if you want to set up a search index or something, but you don't want to have it use multiple interface languages, then you can just ignore its module and not enable it. So that's the second pillar. And there's, two, uh, there's still two more pillars. I'm very excited for the content translation pillar, because in 7, there's not a very good general solutions for this. But in 8, we support all content entities with the content translation pillar. In 7, you need to use a combination of the content translation and the entity translation models to get the best out of both worlds. In 8, we have one solution for all content entities. What content entities are in 8, uh, you may ask? Um, so there's entities, and some of them are content entities. In 8, there's also entities that are not content entities. We'll get to that a bit later. Uh, content entities are things that you usually can add fields on. This is not an entirely correct um, explanation, but that's usually the case. So for example, to nodes, to users, to comments, to taxonomy terms, etc., you can add fields. Uh, menu links are not fieldable. and um, and uh, not so that's not this the rule does not entirely apply, but that's usually the case. These um, these content entities share the same system in Drupal Core, and this is the system that Drupal Commerce and a lot of the other contributed modules will use to have content in their system. So this translation support extends to uh, there. We have an integrated configuration system for this, and it's field based. So you've seen this screen from before for a language setup. And now let's see what we can do here for, um, for setting up translations. So we have these entity types. And if you enable content translation, there's a translatable checkbox for them that you can tick. And then every field will have its configuration on its own, whether you want to have title, body, comment settings, image, et cetera, translatable. An image defaults to the file itself not be translated, but the textual properties of the image translated. So it's very flexible and very detailed. 
you can go down to the field level and configure field by field, and you can go down to the sub-field level even for things like images and make them uh, set up separate for languages. Why is this useful? If you click and make every field translatable, this basically reproduces the node copy translation model that is in Drupal 7. It's in the core content translation module. If you configure the fields separately, then it reproduces either the NTD translation module from 7 or the uh, IATN uh, sharing uh, content uh, field sharing module with the core content translation module. So basically, we have one system that can be used in both ways. And you can configure it um, and go from one model to the other very easily. There's no content migration needed or any other special uh, way between the two methods. It's just one method that's very flexible. We also have a translation interface that will be very familiar. It's basically the same that uh, was before. You have a translate tab on your node in this case. So you can go there for translations. It has a summary of all the translations available for that node. You can go edit the translation, and it uses the same uh, user interface that the node submission itself uses that's different from 7, but it's the same across editing and translation. And you can see all the fields that you have access to, even those that are not translatable. If you have access to them, you can edit them, and they will apply to all languages. Uh, for translating properties like title and author and created and um, published and promoted and sticky and things like that, that is in the works. Uh, we have it almost done for all the node properties, and we have issues to work this out for menu properties and for taxonomy term properties. So you should hopefully be able to uh, end up trans being able to translate menu labels and taxonomy term names and all the properties in notes will be multilingual as well. So this is very exciting. I'm looking forward to that a lot. Uh, the upgrade path um, is, um, as you may have heard, not really called an upgrade path anymore in Drupal 8. A migration solution is going to be included in Drupal 8. And uh, may, um, part of that may be in Contrib. Part of that may be in Core. This is currently being worked on in the Sandbox. So um, we did not work out exactly what kind of combination uh, of all the migrations will happen. Um, the entity translation solution in 7 and a lot of the IATN modules are contributed modules in 7. So core will not necessarily include migration paths for data from contributed modules. So part of the migration path will likely be in contrib, and part of the migration path will likely be in core. Uh, good news also is that a lot of the other APIs support this system now. The core search API uh, supports this. So if you integrate with Apache Solar, every language information is passed on there. If you use core search, everything about language is stored, and we index separate translations as separate items. The node access API has language support, so you can have uh, separate access per language um, on nodes. There's a lot of possibilities um, in here. So the uh, content language pillar was really about extending language translation features in a way that's future-proof. So we wanted to set this up um, with support for as wide um, as possible in the content system. So we built support for this in the node access API. We built support for this in search indexing and the search API. We built in uh, language information to all content entities, so now every content entity knows its language. We have very flexible language setup on bundles, um, fields, and subfield level, even for images. We work, we're still working on some properties and the migration path. But once this is rounded out, I think this is going to be the most flexible solution for content translation ever in um, Drupal. And the final piece of the puzzle is configuration translation. And this is something that Drupal Core never had a solution for. And Drupal 8 is really shining here. So let's see what is configuration in Drupal 8 in the first place. So I've shown you before that there's entities in Drupal 8, and some of those entities are content. Uh, Drupal 8 also has configuration that has a full configuration system. And some of those are entities, and some of those are not. 
So we have the configuration system that supports things like views, vocabularies, contact categories, fields, etc. So a lot of these, th these things that are edited by the administrators that are not created daily on the site usually, but they are um, setting up the site or containers for other things like vocabularies uh, are for taxonomy terms. And there are one-off settings like site information, user emails, et cetera, that, are, uh, that just exist once. Um, so those are not entities, but they are global configuration. The good news is this uh, blue circle, the configuration circle, is covered for language support in Drupal 8. And as we've already talked about it, the green circle for content is also covered by the multilingual system in Drupal 8. If you build a Drupal 8 solution, a module, um, or uh, some kind of other solution, and you are not in these circles, then you are probably in trouble for language support. You need to be solving that problem on your own. Uh, in core, for example, path aliases are not in these circles. They are a totally separate system but they have their own solution for a language. So if you have a module that is not using the Drupal 8 configuration system or content entities, then you need to do your own multilingual support. I would not uh, suggest you do that because the configuration system and the content entity system is really powerful and is very well supported. If you work with these, then you'll get support for deployment, for views integration, for a lot of other things that will be much harder to do if you don't use these APIs. So not just for multilingual, but for basically any integration reason, you should use these systems in Drupal 8. The good news for multilingual is you will likely use this system. So your module on Drupal.org will likely support multilingual uh, for a lot of sites to come. So what we did in configuration to do this is we track language on every configuration file. So all of these things that I mentioned to you before in the configuration system are stored in files, and we track language on each of them. So we know the language of a view or of a vocabulary or of a menu or of a contact category or the site information itself. So we track language on each of those, and we have language overrides stored with the configuration. So we have language variations of the view, of the menu, of the site information, et cetera, in all the languages that you, that you set up on your site. So for shift configuration, this is how it works. This is a default contact category called website feedback. And we can translate shift configuration as part of the interface translation system. So to be able to demonstrate this, I will add the language switcher block now to the sidebar so you can see that when I'm switching languages, it actually works. And I have English and Hungarian on this site. So now if I switch between English and Hungarian, nothing really happens because this is not yet translated. But if I go to translating the interface of the site and I search for website feedback, I will find this uh, contact category name. I can translate this to Hungarian and then save that, and it will save not only to the uh, translation, but also to the configuration system. And from then on, when I use the screen in Hungarian, it just works in Hungarian. So all the configuration that's included with Drupal is translatable as part of the software itself. And the good news there is the community will be able to translate that uh, for you. And this will be downloaded as part of the translations of Drupal itself. This integration is still being worked on on localized Drupal.org. A lot of the new things in Drupal 8 are already translatable. The default configuration is still in the works to be supported there. But there is also a solution for any configuration. So let's say this block you want to translate. We have a configuration translation module in core that provides you with translate tabs on all the things that are in configuration. For example, the block you can translate to Hungarian and for the site name and slogan, you can translate to Hungarian as well. You go to site information, there's a translate tab there that lists all the languages on the site. Then you can add the Hungarian translation here uh, for both values. So really, this spans to everything in configuration. This applies to views, user roles, um, uh, filter formats, 
or shortcut sets or menus, etc. So now you switch to Hungarian, the site name, the slogan, the blog title, and as previously seen, the uh, contact category title will be Hungarian. And if you switch back to English, then it will be English again. So we have a generic configuration system in Drupal 8. And we have a generic solution for translating those configurations to other languages. Uh, and that basically lets us translate anything that's in the configuration system to other languages. We also built a very nice and easy API to integrate with the system. So if you are a module developer, it's very easy to integrate your configuration with the translation system. So in summary, the configuration translation has a full translation module in core called configuration translation that can translate anything. It uses standard translation tabs on pages which where you actually added the configuration, but there's also a summary table where you can look through all the configuration on your site and go and translate them. This uses configuration overrides with the configuration system that is deployment friendly and can be pushed to live sites. This works for anything in configuration, views, uh, user role names, filter formats, contact categories, vocabularies, etc. And the shipped configuration will be able to be translated by the community. Uh, so when Drupal ships, uh, you download the translation and all the views and user roles and filter formats and all of those will be translated to your language and can be translated to other languages as well. So that's, I think, pretty cool for something that we did not have any solution built into Drupal 7 and required a lot of modules um, to work out. So again, in summary, the four pillars in Drupal 8 are language, where we made language selection the first in the installer. We have language assignment everywhere in Drupal core, so we know language of everything. And we've expanded the language detection features and made it much simpler to configure. We have the interface translation pillar where we automated downloads from the community for the software translation, made it possible to track customizations and protect them from being overwritten. We made this deployment friendly so you can test and quality assure those translation updates. And we have a content translation pillar which supports every type of content and is future proof for uh, entities that use the entity and field system and has field level translatability configuration is very flexible. And we have the configuration translation pillar, which works with the configuration system and therefore supports everything in the configuration system and has general translation solutions across all of those on your site. So in Drupal 8, I think it's the first time when we have solutions across um, everything managed by Drupal in a way that's future proof even for the modules that you install later on and you add to your site. In the words of uh, Tobias Tuckler, one of the um, brave souls that are, have been working on or are even are currently working on this initiative, with content and configuration translation in core, Drupal 8 core is more translatable than Drupal 7 with all of the contributed modules uh, added up. So I think that's quite a statement. Um, and. Um, it's pretty true. If you want to get involved with this initiative, uh, we work on Drupal.org, but we have our own visualizations uh, of all the things that we do on Drupal 8 multilingual.org, where we uh, collect visualizations of the issues we work on in the uh, team meetings, etc. Localized Drupal.org is where Drupal 8 can be translated to other languages and is already being translated. Uh, we have a Twitter account at twitter.com slash dmi. There is a sprint coming up for a whole week in Saged, Drupal Dev Days Saged, uh, end of March, March 24th to the 30th. And there's a sprint coming up at DrupalCon uh, Austin, uh, which is also pretty long from May 30th to June 8th. There's a sprint before and after DrupalCon and uh, at DrupalCon as well. So I would urge you to get involved in here. And as a good way to start out getting involved is to try this out. It is possible to try all this out because everything I, um, I demonstrate here is included with Drupal 8 core. So you just go to drupal.org slash 8, and there's a big green button that says test Drupal 8 dev, and it launches you a website. You don't need to have anything installed on your computer. You can check out Drupal 8 and all of these improvements in there um, and test them out. And once again, 
these are all the people who made this possible to happen. Um, as almost a thousand people. It was a lot of work and it's still a lot of work and it's also a lot of fun. Um, and I'm happy that we um, came this far and thanks for listening. Gabor, can you read out their names now, please? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, um, I think we covered it largely, or sorry, you covered it largely during the session, but uh, could you just specifically say how many multilingual modules for common tasks will be needed in Drupal 8 compared to Drupal 7? So I think in Drupal 8, um, there's uh, four modules in Drupal Core that support the whole spectrum. And uh, in Drupal 7, uh, that's easily 30 or more modules that you need to set up um, to support these scenarios. Right. And as Tobias Strickler said, uh, with those 31 modules installed, you still don't have the functionality that you have with the four D8 yeah, modules. core modules that come delivered with every V8 that yeah. everybody downloads. Indeed. So um, the other question here from the audience was, how many D7 contrib modules were integrated into D8 core? Uh, as for as for multilingual, um, there's uh, I I haven't been keeping count. But there's at least the fallback language negotiation module, the admin language module, the localization update module, most of the IETN module, the entity translation module, the title module, the variable modules, um, which is like four separate modules. And then uh, what else am I missing? Probably I don't have lot. that many fingers. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was counting. So this is just the most lingual stuff. OK, so several, a lot, many. Yeah. Right, great. Thank you so much for taking the time to update your session and present it again. I got just about ex as excited this time as I did the first time I saw you do this session. And I'm incredibly excited about Drupal 8 for so many reasons. And your team, your group, the multilingual initiative, all of those 1,000 plus people have gotten me a lot more excited. I think that this puts our CMS just way, way, way out in front of every system online. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gabor, but thank you, everyone else, so, so very much. Um, for the technical details, if you have questions for Gabor or for me, we are easily found on Twitter. I, and um, this video will be on YouTube for you to watch. Gabor's slides, <coughs> sorry from today are live on SlideShare, and I posted the link to that on this Google event page, this Google Hangout page. I will also be reposting this session in the conversation with Gabor uh, in the reasonably near future on the Acquia podcast and Acquia blog streams. So uh, anything you missed, there's plenty of chances for you to watch this again, plenty of chances for, um, for you to get in touch with us. My Twitter name. Now, I guess I don't have this anywhere on a slide, but my Twitter handle is at HornCologne, H-O-R-N-C-O-L-O-G-N-E. And Gabor, your Twitter handle is Gabor Hoichi, yes. but I would like you to spell it for everyone. It's G-A-B-O-R-H-O-J-T-S-Y written on Twitter. Great. Okay. Gabor, thank you so much. I am really looking forward to seeing you in Seged in Hungary. I'm going to be there. And um, uh, yeah, I'm looking for that Seged feeling. <laughs> Yay. Cool. OK. So take care. Have a good one, Gabor. Any last words for us? Uh, thanks again for all those thousand people. It's, re it's really it's always amazing for me as well to go through all the things that we did. It's just outstanding. All right, man. Take care. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.